you very much. So as uh, the title says, I will talk about 4D equals 2 supersymmetric theories on S4. And then I'll talk a bit about their localization, but the bulk of today will be to put an n equals 2 theory on the 4 sphere. So for the n equals 2 supersymmetric theory is, of course, just a quantum field theory, which is invariant under the n equals 2 super Poincaré algebra. So the super Poincaré algebra uh, is generated by the usual momentum generator, where in my notation m is a space index. So I'm already in Euclidean signature, so I label the space indices by 1 to 4. There's also the usual rotational generators. And there are additionally eight real supercharges, which are organized in uh, two spinners which carry an additional index i which runs over one and two. So alpha, alpha, dot are the standard spinners. Although again, I mean Euclidean uh, signature, so alpha and alpha dot, they're really independent. They're rotated by independent SU2s and these two are not quite uh, complex conjugates. Instead, each supercharge separately satisfies some symplectic reality property. And to be actually precise, there is also uh, a central charge and its complex conjugates. So this is the, the set of generators, and their algebra for this is just a standard Poincaré algebra. So let me indicate what the algebra is of these supercharges. It's just, in some sense, an extension of the n equals 1 Poincaré algebra, where we have an anti-commutator that looks like so. But I mentioned there's also these central charges. They're somewhat similar to the central charge that appeared this morning, but uh, they don't carry extra indices, so they really do act on point operators on local operators instead of on extended objects, and they appear in the anti-commutation relations of supercharges with themselves, or at least Q with Q instead of Q with Q tilde. And similarly for Q tilde, where you have a complex conjugate sitting over here. And the central object, given that the name already indicates that it's central, it commutes with it commutes with anything. So this is the super Poincaré algebra in four dimensions. And uh, for most of my talk, I will really not uh, care about the central charge. I will mostly just set them to zero. But just know that, in principle, they're there. Now, when the central charges are zero, you can easily see that this algebra has an, outer, uh, an automorphism acting on it, namely these indices i and j, they can be acted on by SU2R rotations. So I already indicated that we will call this the R symmetry. And Q and Q tilde can be acted oppositely by a U and R symmetry. So this al uh, the super Poincaré algebra really has an SU2R times U and R automorphism, which is the R symmetry of an N equals 2 theory. But again, when, central, when z is present, you immediately see that the U1R symmetry is really not present anymore. So with z, you have the SU2 still, or does it break the whole thing? No, you can see that this is an invariant tensor under SU2. So. so we have a, an algebra. Now let's look at which multiplets uh, we can consider in this algebra. In particular, I will just consider the massless multiplets, in fact, the massless matter multiplets, which are relevant to built Lagrangians. And just as a side comment, as soon as you restrict yourself to considering massless multiplets, you necessarily have to set z and z bar equals to zero. It's a consequence of, of the fact that they're massless. So there's two such multiplets. First of all, we have the vector multiplet. Uh, 
Its field content is, of course, the gauge field. It contains one complex scalar, so phi and its complex conjugate, and it contains a bunch of gagini. So the gagini, they are rotated by this SU2R symmetry, the phi and phi tilde, they carry charge under the U1R, and A is, of course, neutral under it all. And given that this is a vector multiplet, I'm considering these all to live in the adjoint representation of whatever gauge group I would like to consider. Now, in fact, if I want to consider an off-shell version of the vector multiplet, I should add an SU2R triplet of auxiliary fields. And you can see that this multiplet is actually nothing else than a copy of an n equals 1 vector multiplet and an n equals 1 adjoint Kara multiplet. So these guys and half of the fermions is the Kara multiplets. This guy and the other half of the fermions together, well, together with one field here is the vector multiplet and the two other guys actually sit in the off-shell Kara multiplet. So that's one massless multiplet to build Lagrangians with and the other one goes under the name of the hypermultiplet. And in fact, let me immediately consider R such hypermultiplets. Then the field content is an SU2R doublet scalar fields which also carries an index A, which I'll explain in a second. And there are two uh, fermionic partners. So this index A is a USP2R index because it's just a, a fact of life that R hypermultiplets carry in the USP2R flavor symmetry. Let's uh, unpack this a little bit. So notice also that I just restrict myself to an on-shell representation here for the time being. So let's unpack this a little bit. Let's just look at a single hypermultiplet. A single hypermultiplet, in fact, is nothing else than two n equals one Kara multiplets. And let me denote these n equals one Kara multiplets in superfield language as Q and Q tilde. But in abuse of notation, I will also use these notations for the scalars themselves. Then you can organize the scalars in these two n equals one Kara multiplets, so Q and Q tilde and their complex conjugates, in a matrix like so. where in this matrix the rows are exchanged by the SU2R symmetry and the columns are exchanged by the USP2 flavor symmetry. So another way of saying it, we really had in two n equals one carrier multiplets, we had four real scalars. In principle, you can think that they are acted on by an SO4 symmetry. And SO4 is, of course, nothing else than SU2 times SU2. One of these SU2s acts as an R symmetry. The other SU2 is isomorphic to USP2, which acts as a flavor symmetry. But more generally, this USP2 gets enhanced to USP2R. Uh, and given such a collection of hypermultiplets with this type of a flavor symmetry, which acts as the index here indicates, we can try to gauge some subgroup of this flavor symmetry by identifying it with the gauge symmetry that is carried by the vector multiplets. If you do so, then uh, however you embed the gauge group in this flavor symmetry group, there will be some kind of a commutant, and that commutant will be the flavor symmetry of the remaining uh, of the theory that we're actually looking at. So more concretely, let's imagine that we have n hypermultiplets transforming in some representation R of the gauge group then what is the remaining flavor symmetry it depends on the properties of this representation R. So it's really an exercise of embedding things in USP 2 R but let me immediately give the answer. If R is complex then these things carry a flavor symmetry SUN if R is real then there is a flavor symmetry of USP 2 N and if R is pseudo-real, there is a flavor symmetry SO2N. So I went through the three cases because it will be somewhat important in later talks I will, give, will be given to have uh, the three cases in mind. So maybe you can do this as a little exercise to, to show that this is indeed 
the correct flavor symmetry depending on the properties of this representation R. Maybe let me do one example of this. Imagine that you have one adjoint hypermultiplet. Then according to this statement, that joint representation is always real. We expect, since we only have one of them, a USP2 flavor symmetry. And indeed, that USP2 flavor symmetry is simply this flavor symmetry that is depicted here. Q and Q tilde, and well, all the fields here transform the same real representation. Q star, in principle, would be the, adjoint reps, uh, the complex conjugate representation, but since the adjoint representation is real, this flavor symmetry is not broken by introducing, uh, introducing the coupling to the gauge field. So this USP2 is really the flavor symmetry of a single adjoint hypermultiplet, which means that if you have an n equals 4 theory described as an n equals 2 theory, you really have an SU2 or USP2 flavor symmetry. So good, we, we know now what the algebra is. We know what the massless multiplets are of that symmetry algebra. And now I would like to describe how the algebra acts on these multiplets. But to save me some writing, let me just introduce the notations I'm using. So we had over there Q I alpha. And when I write the object delta, I really mean that I have some type of a killing spinner which contracts with this supercharge and similarly for the Q tildes, I will have a situation like this, where in this talk, and presumably in all localization talks, you will hear Xi is not treated as a fermionic object, but I keep it uh, bosonic. So maybe that is not standard, but that's what I will do. So delta is still a fermionic object, and this delta acts on these multiplets in the following way. So there's no need to copy these all. This is just to indicate how things transform. At one point, we will need some of these transformation rules. So I will just keep these things on the blackboards. If you would like to play with these transformation rules themselves, I just copied them from a paper of Hama and Hosomichi. So good, we have multiples, we have transformation rules. Let's now consider actions. The Yang-Mills action starts off, of course, in the standard way. We have the kinetic term for the gauge fields, the usual F squared. We have a kinetic term for the two scalars over there, the auxiliary fields enter quadratically. We have some commutator term among the scalars, and then we have a bunch of fermionic stuff, which I will not quite write. And similarly, you can construct an action for the hypermultiplet. Again, you can read the concrete expression in this paper I mentioned by Hama and also Michi. Now, what I would like to point out is that in the variations I wrote, I added <coughs> two somewhat special terms, or maybe I haven't added it yet over here. I want to add here a somewhat funny term because at the moment we're just doing Poincaré supersymmetry in flat space. So these spinners over here, they're just constant. They just label which supercharges am I talking about. They're just constants which tell you which combination of supercharges. But now I'm adding a derivative of that parameter, which really is just zero for the time being since I'm just talking about super Poincaré. So the derivative is g to 0. Here there is a similar term. <coughs> and over there, I already included them. Now, the reason I included these uh, derivative terms is the following. If we were to take this action and we try to transform it, say we take the Young-Mills action, we try to transform it with respect to these transformation rules, of course, it's an invariant action. So at worst, it should become it should become a total derivative, which then, if you integrate it to form an action, 
you actually get zero up to boundary terms, which we ignore. But let me now try to compute the neutral currents associated to these supersymmetry variations. So the standard procedure to compute neutral currents is to take the transformation rules under the, the symmetry we would like to consider, but consider position-dependent parameters. If you take the parameters to be instead of constants position-dependent, you should expect that these rules changes a bit. You will pick up transformations, uh, terms in the transformation of the Lagrangian, which are proportional to derivatives of the parameter I'm considering. So generally, you should consider, you should expect that the transformation will look something like this, where I pick up terms proportional to these now position-dependent transformation parameters. So again, if you make them constant, we got invariance. Now I take them position dependence. I pick up derivatives, and the object that multiplies these derivatives is the neutral current for the symmetry we're considering. So these are really the supercurrents, which are already featured this morning in Guido's talks. OK, this is all fine. But now you can sort of start feeling why I felt like introducing these extra terms containing derivatives in the transformation rules. I introduced them such that the terms I pick up proportional to the derivatives have a special property. These currents will have a special property. And that special property is, well, first of all, the not special property of these currents is that they are conserved on shell. This is just a consequence of the fact that they're neutral currents. But the special property, which appears as soon as I add these somewhat uh, empty of meaning terms, from the point of view of the Poincaré superalgebra, as soon as I add those terms, the supercurrents all of a sudden have a second property. Namely, that classically, their sigma traces are 0. So by adding these extra little terms proportional to derivatives in the Killing spinners, we found that the supercurrent that appears here has an extra property. Now, this extra property is actually quite useful because now you see that if we give a very special position dependence to these objects that sit over here, we're going to find invariance of the Lagrangian or of the action even with position dependence. And that extra special property is Given that the sigma traces of j is equal to 0, if this object were actually proportional to a sigma matrix, we would find that this object is 0. So if the derivative of the killing spinner is in fact, let me introduce some extra minus i's just because people like these conventions. If I choose a position dependence of the spinners such that this property holds, then you plug that in here, you use that, well, you just throw the sigma matrix to the other side, and then you find sigma times j, which is 0. And similarly, for the tilde spinner, if you demand that a property like this holds, you can uh, say something similar over here. So that's interesting. We started off with actions over here, which we designed to be invariant under super Poincaré symmetry, invariant under these super Poincaré uh, super variations, when we add these extra terms proportional to derivatives, we all of a sudden find that there is more supersymmetry in town than we had hoped for. Not just constants over here, but also position-dependent objects as long as they de satisfy this equation. So these equations go under the name of conformal killing spinner equations. And you will hear a lot more about these types of equations from Guido, but I've der derived them here in a somewhat uh, simple fashion. So the solutions to these equations on flat space are particularly simple. Of course, we still find, oh, I should have mentioned, these, these primed spinners, they're just totally arbitrary spinners. 
and they can be anything because the only property I really need is that there's a sigma matrix here to use this property to make this zero. So these prime spinners are anything, but of course they're not really anything. I contract this with a sigma matrix. I find that this really is sigma u del mu xi i up to a factor of four and some factors of i. But fine, this in principle you can take them anything they need to be to satisfy this equation. And the solutions then are just this constant which we started off with. Of course we didn't lose the constant solution. So this is some constant. plus a manifestly position dependent piece so we find a solution like this where both xi hat and xi tilde hat are constants Are you missing a prime on the left on the left here yeah. no i'm solving for xi and this guy can be whatever it needs to be. So in this case, it would be this object again. So and similarly, I can solve for xi tilde. It takes a similar expression. There's two constants and an x sigma p is in between. So what is the character that you've written between the sigma and the minus i? An x, its position. Oh. x m. And the sigma tilde? That's just to indicate that it's a constant. Oh, where? On the sigma tilde? On the xi tilde. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, xi tilde. The hat is just to indicate that it's a constant. Maybe I should have done it all along. So these were also constants, if you like. So, stupid question, but sigma matrices are always invertible because they've got non zero each invertible, yes? So I, I, can all, I can always find psi, such psi prime that satisfies this equation. Sure, you're saying that psi prime is really something like, well, up to factors. Sure, that's true. The point is that the different derivatives of psi i are related to each other because, uh, I mean, they have to be all equal up to multiplication by some sigma matrix. Exactly. So you see the index, yeah. That. So the other solution simply looks like something like this. So we already understood these constant pieces of these solutions. These constants just describe my Poincaré supersymmetry with which I started off, but these additional constants seem to add another eight fermionic symmetries to my system. So the question is, what are these eight additional symmetries? And the answer is, as already indicated by the C, they're conformal supersymmetries. So we're discovering slowly superconformal invariants of four-dimensional n equals two theories, at least classically. So I should maybe re-emphasize this. All the words I'm saying here, they're classical words. As soon as you have quantum effects, these kinds of equations may or may not hold still. Well, this equation in particular, this one will still hold, but this one may be violated as soon as you have uh, a quantum mechanic, or as soon as you allow for quantum uh, effects. So we slowly discover classical superconformal symmetries of n equals two theories. So let's uh, explore that a little bit more. Let's explore the additional symmetries by simply trying to compute the supersymmetry variation squared. So let's compute the algebra of 
the supersymmetry variations, but now taking into account that these parameters can be position dependence, as the solution indicates over there. And in fact, I have explicit derivatives in the variation rules, which will talk to the position dependence. So let's, for example, like take that multiplet, and you just act twice with a supersymmetry variation parameterized by some xi and some xi tilde, which you can think of as explicitly looking like the solution I wrote over there. If you do that, what will you find? Now, if these things were constant, we should, of course, recover the super Poincaré algebra, with which I just erased. So if these things had been constant, or were still constant, we would have expected uh, uh, abstractly that the square of the supersymmetry variation is just a lead derivative in the direction of a vector v, where this v is a particular bilinear in the killing spinners. So given these two killing spinners, which parameterize my supercharge, as over here, if they were still constant, it would be like over there, then I find a particular vector, which, of course, will just be the translations in the four directions, as indicated by the algebra I deleted over here. But now I have this position dependence, so this thing actually picks up more types of transformations. The first transformation that you additionally find is a scale transformation with some parameter w, which I will not specify in detail. There will be a UNR transformation with some parameter theta, where both w and theta are, again, some bilinears in the killing spinners. In fact, contain, they also contain the derivative of the killing spinner, so indeed they're zero as soon as I go back to my old case of super Poincaré you will find SU2R transformations. And of course, as always, if you don't act on gauge invariant stuff, you also find the gauge transformation. So again, these parameters, all three of them, they are parameterized in terms of xi and xi tilde and their derivatives. And they are zero as soon as you set to zero the derivatives. So this is the general. Uh, the general transformation or the general algebra given these position dependent xi and xi tildes. And in particular, I'd like to focus on this object, this vector over here. The first property that you can easily verify given, given my conformal spinner equation over there is that this vector is in fact a conformal killing vector. So what does that mean? On flat space, it means that we have an equation like this. So if the right-hand side had been zero, then we were talking about uh, actual killing vectors. But now on the right-hand side, it's not zero, so I'm talking about conformal killing vectors. Conformal killing vectors, of course, specify conformal transformations, which are, OK, I'm still talking about flat space. So conformal transformations are transformations which keep the metric in this case, 8 mn, or since I'm really doing Euclidean, I may as well write delta mn, which keep delta mn invariant up to a vile rescaling. So that's the definition. And if you impose that requirement that the metric remains invariant under the action of this type of a vector, then you will find that this equation needs to hold. So this is the conformal killing vector equation. And its solution can be found in all generality. First of all, you find constants, which parameterize the translations. You find a matrix of constants, which parameterize the rotations. You find yet another constant, which parameterizes scaling, so dilatations. And finally, you find something somewhat more complicated, which is uh, parameterized by a vector. And these are the special conformal transformations. OK, so we already knew what the constant piece was. That's just, that just corresponds to the translations. We already knew the rotations. This guy corresponds to dilatations, so three scalings. And this guy 
as I said, are the special conformal transformations. Now, in principle, you can have some fun given this explicit conformal killing vector to figure out what the transformation rules are or the, what the algebra is of these generators by just studying, well, essentially the commutators of these things. But let me already give the answer. Schematically, the dilatation commutes with, well, gives as a commutator with PM, PM again, which roughly speaking just says that P is an object of dimension one. On the special conformal transformations, you find the opposite, it's a minus sign, it's an object of dimension minus one. The more interesting commutator is between the special conformal transformations and the translations, which contains, uh, first of all, First of all, the dilatation back, and second of all, the rotations. And now the more interesting... That's MN. MN, yes, sorry. MN, MN. The more interesting transformation rules are, of course, among the fermionic objects. So maybe I should have well, written over there. We now have these two constant parameters. And delta, really, the delta I'm using here, parameterized by sine xi tilde with that type of position dependence, it's really the one constant talking to the Q and the other constant talking to a new fermionic generator, which I will call S. And then similarly for the tilde object. The superscript is on like C's or superscript? Sorry? The superscript on the it's just S for supersymmetry and C for conformal or superconformal symmetry. Okay. So I have the Qs. I already understood their algebra. I already wrote it before. Sorry. It is just a translation. Similarly, you can convince yourself, given this transformation rule, that the anti commutator of two S's is the special, tra special conformal transformation. And finally, the anti commutator between a Q and an S, let me now just be schematic, let's not write all the indices. It's some epsilon, well, it's roughly speaking a D plus an M plus an R plus a little r, where D is a dilatation. So to soak up the indices, you have two epsilon symbols here. M is again the rotation, R is the SU2R symmetry, and little r is the UNR symmetry. So this algebra can be just derived from the explicit expressions we found on this multiplet, for example. Sorry, uh, if we go back to Poincaré supertrust case, then what we, what each term have left? For Poincaré supersymmetry, all these are absent. Okay. Poincaré supersymmetry, of course, just has on the right hand side the conformal, well, the killing vector trans, uh, corresponding to translations. But now we pick up these extra terms, which are reflected, well, which are reflected in these additional anti-commutators. In particular, the K corresponds to V being precisely this object. And then the D, M, and R, and little r, well, the r and, li r and little r we had explicitly sitting here. The scale transformation was the D, and the V soaks up the, soaks up the M and the spatial action of D. Uh, 
So, so far we have found that classically n equals 2 supersymmetric theories have actually some additional uh, symmetries. They are in fact invariant under a full supermorphomal algebra, namely that algebra. Maybe I should mention at this point that to keep these statements true quantum mechanically, you should really ensure that the beta function vanishes. Uh, examples when the beta function vanishes are of course pure n equals 4 super Young Mills or n equals 2, an n equals 2 theory with gauge group SUN and 2N fundamental hypermultiplets. And there are more examples, but these two will do. Now, if the beta function is zero, then, um, well, then scaling symmetry is restored. Scaling symmetry, in particular, implies that the trace of the stress tensor is equal to zero. The trace of the stress tensor actually sits in the same multiplet as these sigma traces. So you see, this is what Guido was mentioning this morning as well. Uh, there is a, num uh, a multiplet of anomalies which in particular contain this, the strays of the stress tensor, the conservation of the U and R current, and a bunch more. And if the beta function is zero, this, this sub-anomaly, sub-multiplet can in fact be consistently set to zero. And then you have all the statements I mentioned just now. Okay, so at the moment we found that n equals two theories classically have that symmetry, quantum mechanically still if the beta function vanishes. But in fact, there is even more symmetry that we could consider. We could not just consider conformal symmetries, which as I said are, say for the flat space case, their symmetry is such that if you act on the metric, you do not get back the same metric, but the same metric possibly with some position dependent rescaling. Now, vial transformations, they have a similar flavor. Vial transformations are transformations that send the metric to some rescaled version of itself. And while the metric rescales also local operators undergo some rescaling, This is a vial rescaling of some theory, so the metric goes back to itself up to a vial factor. Local operators transform into themselves up to the same vial factor, which is now raised to the power minus delta O, where delta O is the scaling dimension of the operator we're talking about. So in my algebra, uh, which is deleted now, I had like this scale piece. There was a scale W. The coefficient of that piece will be precisely this dimension. So good, these are vial transformations. And let me just, to be clear what the difference is between vial transformations and conformal transformations, contrast the two cases. So vial transformations are defined over here. Conformal transformations are transformations such that the metric also <coughs> transforms into itself up to a prefactor. But now this transformation should be such that this vial rescaled metric is in fact diffeomorphic to the original metric. So this is in fact g prime mu nu at position x, where g prime mu nu at position x prime is the standard transformation rule for a metric. So this is the transformation rule for a metric under diffeomorphisms. And conformal transformations are such that the metric goes back to itself up to a file factor, which is diffeomorphic to itself. So said differently, they're just all diffeomorphisms such that if you apply them, you end back with the same metric, but with a file factor. The file transformations are more general. They're just transformations that scale the metric, but without the requirement that it should be diffeomorphic to itself. So in particular, you can immediately see that 
if you have vial invariance in any arbitrary background metric, then of course you will have conformal invariance. And in fact, the opposite is also true. If you have conformal invariance in flat space for a unitary theory, in fact, you can prove vial invariance. But this is a, it's a complicated proof. If you want to read it, it's in a paper by Luthi and friends. So, very good. I would like to study vial transformations of my n equals 2 theories. And the first observation I can make when trying to study that is that the conformal uh, killing spinner equation, so this, the equations over here, these killing spinner equations, that they are in fact vial covariant. So let me write these equations in slightly more covariant form. So replace the partial derivatives with covariant derivatives, which I can do if I have given any Riemannian metric. So this type of an equation is vial covariant. Um, maybe you should check that as an exercise. So the vial weight of the killing spinner is a half. So if you take the metric and send it to omega squared times itself, you take the killing spinner and you send it times to omega to the one half times itself, then this equation picks up an overall factor. What is nabla? In this equation. Nabla is just the covariant derivative. Yeah. Or you want it, how it acts on the spinner? Is that what the question is? Before we said that the psi is not spinner in the beginning. No, I said psi is spinner, but it just... Uh, sorry, I, uh, maybe I, okay, S psi is of course a spinner, but it's not anti-commuting, that's what I meant, sorry. So, just to be totally explicit, this thing is the usual partial derivative plus one quarter a spin connection term. something like so. <coughs> yes. So, okay, you know how the metric transforms in particular, that also implies you know how the wheel binds transform. If you know how the wheel binds transform, you can figure out how the spin connection transforms. If you know how the spin connection transforms, you can figure out that this thing is covariant under the transformations. So that's, that's good. Second observation you can make is that the covariantized transformation rules are also vial transform, vial covariant. In fact, you could have figured out which derivative terms to add to the transformation rules precisely by imposing that they are vial covariant. So that's good. We know killing spinner equation and the transformation rules are vial covariant. Now what about the actions? I did not quite write them completely, but I did write the bosonic terms, although they're not on the blackboard anymore. But you should expect that uh, the action from for scalar fields should be modified a bit simply because the, the box operator on curved space is not vial invariant or vial covariant in and of itself. The combination that is in fact transforming properly under vial transformation is box minus the scalar curvature divided by six. This is, this is in 4D. So if we add terms that reflect this curvature dependence to the action. So we should add terms to the action that go like scalar curvature phi phi for the vector multiplet action, scalar curvature qi qi for the hypermultiplet action with appropriate coefficient, like one sixth times whatever coefficient was already present in the kinetic term. If you do that, then also the action will be vial covariant. In fact, the action will be vial invariant. So everything seems to transform very nicely under vial transformations, which is a useful observation because my aim, as the title used to say, is to put supersymmetric theories on S4. And S4 happens to be related, the metric on S4 is related to by 
precisely a vial transformation to the metric on flat space. So given that I explained everything there is to know about superconformal symmetry on flat space, I can just apply my vial transformation to everything I said on flat space and get statements on S4. So we get S4 almost for free from all the work we did in the previous, I don't know how long, um, because the metric on S4, using the stereographic projection, if you like, can be written as follows. This is my vial factor. This is my flat space metric, this is my vial factor, and then I get a metric on S4. It's sorry. It's 4 times r squared, where r is the radius of the S4. So it's some constant radius I chose. And the x squared that sits here is just the sum of the xi squareds. So good. Essentially, I have put now an n equals 2 supersymmetric theory on the force sphere because these transformation rules, they were well behaved on the vial transformations. The actions are well behaved on the vial transformations. The metric on S4 is related by vial transformation. So these rules and the actions, modulo having to add these extra terms, are precisely supersymmetric transformation rules and actions on the force sphere. Are there any questions about this? So in particular, on the force sphere, we can realize, at least classically, a full SU2, 2, 2 slash 2 super algebra. I haven't mentioned this name yet, but the algebra I described over there is described by the super algebra SU2,2 slash 2, where here the SU2,2 is isomorphic to SO, well, 4,2. I'm, I'm a bit sloppy with um, my signatures, but this is a, this is a correct Isomorphism between Lie algebras, but I was really talking about a Euclidean algebra, so really the Euclidean conformal algebra is SO5, 1. So then here you need to, well, on either side you need to put some stars to make this a correct statement in Euclidean, state, in Euclidean theories. But anyway, so SU2, 2 is a conformal algebra, then, then the SU2 that sits there, this SU2 is just the SU2 R symmetry that our theory has, and then there is a U1 are symmetry still in town as well. So these are the global, well, these are the symmetries that this, the bosonic symmetries of this superalgebra. And then the fermionic symmetries are precisely parameterized by Qs and Ss. So this full algebra can be realized on the four sphere. That's, that's good. Now, on flat space, On flat space, the massive algebra, by which I mean the algebra which you can preserve when you turn on masses, was just super point carré. It's the algebra which which I started. But now on the four sphere, well, let me first say, so this flat space algebra in particular, you can also think of it as the algebra which closes onto isometries of space. So flat R4, the isometries are rotations and translations. And super Poincaré, indeed, in the algebra, you only find translations and rotations. Now, on S4, we would like to find a similar object. We, defined, we would like to define an algebra which closes onto isometries of space. Now, the isometries of S4 are, of course, SO5, just rotations. And we would also like to make sure in my, yes, in my algebra over there, 
the scale transformation, this parameter w, we would like it to be zero because dilatations are obviously not isometries of S4. And since I also like to think of it as a massive algebra or as a just a generic n equals 2 super algebra, I should not expect the U1R to be a symmetry. Typically, U1R symmetries, except for super conformal theories, they are anomalies. They're not really symmetries in the quantum theory. So that symmetry I also don't like. So there are a bunch of symmetries I would not like to have in my super algebra that I would like to describe as this massive super algebra on S4. And if you impose all these conditions, you will find that the massive algebra is OSP2 slash 4. So the SP4 is really isomorphic to SO5. SO5 were indeed the isometries of the four sphere. And the O2, that's really like a U1. And that U1 is the Cartan of SU2R. So the U1R we didn't like, but the Cartan of SU2R we do like, and it appears over here. So notice this, this algebra, we think of it as the massive algebra, but it does contain R symmetries explicitly. On flat space, this is not the case. Massive algebras on flat space never contain R symmetries. We started off with the Poincaré algebra. The R symmetries were automorphisms, but they were not part of the algebra. Here, the R symmetry is explicitly part of the algebra. That is a special feature of having supersymmetry on a curved manifold. R symmetries are or become part of just super algebras. And of course, they're always part of super conformal algebras, but here also of super algebras. So at this moment, I have put the theory on the four sphere using this vial transformation. And next week in Zohar's lectures, you will notice that there is, in fact, an, a really interesting relationship between correlators on the four sphere and correlators on flat space precisely using this type of vial transformation logic. But you need to be careful to take into account all kinds of vial anomalies. But OK, Zohar will talk about that. Excuse me. So yeah. when you play the theory on S4 by vial transformation, <coughs> you have the it's symmetry that has you 2, 2. Um, this is a superconformal symmetry on S4, yes. Uh, superconformal. So far, your theory is uh, superconformal? Well, so far. Either you think it's superconformal when I impose that the beta function is zero, so I select superconformal theories to start with, or the statements I made are classical. I'm asking classical. Classically, you have this algebra. Uh, how you make it a massive to be? No, it's 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 something you need to well, it's by hand essentially. If you well, it's either you say it's by hand or. You could just say, OK, I'm going to turn on masses, say, for the hypermultiplets. And then you will manifestly see that you cannot possibly preserve all the symmetries because the masses introduce a scale. Any particular scale transformations are violated then. Anyway, so if you introduce masses on the four sphere, you will notice that this algebra is definitely not there. But what is still there is this thing. Yeah, my, my naive question is, once you have the super theory, that's the super theory, uh, you play, uh, use vial transformation, place it on S4. Then this is still classical superconformal. Uh, so in a sense, uh, but uh, you have to, but you introduce the scale, right? Because the uh, sphere has the sphere bound on, which is like a mass. mass sure. Right? So then the symmetry should be like OSP. No, the sphere still has. Uh, okay, the sphere has fewer. True conformal, uh, no, true killing vectors, but the number of conformal killing vectors on the four sphere in R four is just equal, and they're both, in both cases, they're described by an SO four comma two algebra. Okay. The, how many supercharge you have on this side? Is sixty. Where here? No, no, the here, eight Poincaré and eight super conformal, and here I have eight, which I can maybe call Poincaré, or just massive. Um, just to introduce some notation, the constraint that takes you from a generic pair of xi and xi tilde satisfying my conformal killing spinner equation to so satisfying the equation I had before. And similarly for the tilde version, 
So it has such sine xi tilde satisfy this equation, then the projection down to OSP2 slash 4 is implemented by declaring that this is not some arbitrary spinner, but that this spinner is in fact related to this spinner in a very specific way. Namely as such. Where S is some arbitrary matrix, sigma mu nu is the standard by well, standard product of two sigma matrices and symmetrized in the two indices, and xi is of course this guy. So if you impose that this spinner is not arbitrary, but instead satisfies this type of equation for some S, then you're not describing the most general transformations anymore, but you are trans describing transformations that lie in this algebra. I just wanted to introduce the symbol S because it will appear later in the talk. And if, you, if you're interested in how the solution then looks like, so after while transforming, after while transforming, the conformal killing spinners picked up this while factor, which I described over here. So a square root of the while factor, the while factor was this thing. So after just while transforming, we have one over square root that factor. So, so notice there is a square here. So it's really the square root of, of just what's in the brackets times just the solution we had before. This is the solution on S4 without imposing this condition. Now, if you do impose this condition, then this guy is not generic anymore, but in fact, it gets replaced with 1 over 2R times xi tilde S. So xi determines, so let me get rid of hats. They're just annoying. So if, if there's a sub, sub superscript in brackets, it means it's these constant things. And now I have over here that this guy is not arbitrary anymore, but in fact it's related to the xi tilde constant that sits over here. And here in this dot 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 you do the same, but then the, the c xi that appears here is really 1 over 2 r, this guy. Okay, this is just to be totally explicit, it's not all that relevant for what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, excuse me. Yes. A very nice question, but this SU to tomato slash two is a particular case of SP two slash four. So this is a this is a subalgebra of, of this thing. Yes. So but you're saying in this particular case where you choose uh, psi uh, well the covariant derivative of psi of psi to yes. be related to psi? Yes. This case corresponds to OSP slash four. Yeah. Uh, so if you want the transformation that lies in here, you should impose that this is true. Why do you have to impose an extra constraint? Because SU two slash two, uh, two comma two slash two is a particular case. No, no, no. This is a subalgebra of this, not the other way around. This is the bigger algebra. So to get to a smaller algebra, you need to constrain something, and the constraint is described like so. Is it clear? It's not clear. Um, so over there we had this W parameter and this theta parameter. We also had transformations which were not isometries of the force sphere, so which are not SO5 rotations. We would like to make sure that all those are zero. And to make sure that all those are zero, what I can figure out, it's not obvious because I didn't tell you, for example, how W and theta look like, but anyway, if I had told you, then it would have been obvious that this is indeed the constraint that manifestly makes sure that, for example, w and theta are equal to zero. It's not all that obvious that it also just restricts the conformal killing vectors that appear there to be just SO5 rotations, but that's also true. So this constraint is imposed to get to the smaller algebra, OSP2 slash 4. Excuse me, why yes. can't you <coughs> impose this algebra? Can you do localization? 
algebra? Well, it depends what your goal is in life. If you want to study massive algebras on S4, uh, massive theories, theories which contain masses, then you simply don't have this algebra. Yeah, but if you, you only have this one. Yeah, but if you consider a conformal If you have a super conformal theory, yeah. then you can pl place it super conformally on the four sphere, and you can try to work with this algebra. What is the form of uh, the matrix S mu? No, S mu, it's, it is whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, eventually, when you plug this back in, you can well, plug this over here, you will figure out what this is, and then you will figure out what S is. So S has a specific form. But to describe the constraint, it's enough that there exists some S that does a job. Okay, the second question, this dot in the plus and this missing part? Yes. And this is also proportional to the... the yeah, it's proportional to this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Not enough space, but... Any more questions? So maybe this was all a bit fast, but the bottom line of the entire discussion is we know how to put theories on the four sphere, preserving supersymmetry. <laughs> and in fact, we can do a little bit better. We cannot just preserve it on the four sphere, but we can also put n equals two theories on a squashed version of the four sphere, where this manifold is really, it's an ellipsoid defined by an embedding equation So I introduce two new par parameters, L and L tilde, where this squashing parameter, as it is often called, B is defined as the square root of their ratio. And this is some, some manifold, some four-dimensional manifold. And it is possible to preserve supersymmetry on this manifold, but everything I said clearly hinged on the fact that the round four sphere is vile related to flat space. This beast is not related in such a way. So to show that there is in fact supersymmetry on this space, you really need full machinery of coupling to background supergravity, which you will hear about from Guido in his lectures. So let me not try to even describe how you would do that. Let me just state that it is possible. And if you really want to see the details, I can again refer to this paper by Hama and Hosomichi. So they described which supergravity background will do the job to preserve some amount of SUSY on this manifold. Okay. So I have put the theory on the four sphere, and this is of course a school on localization, so let me now start localizing. So Francesco this morning started explaining how the localization argument works, uh, not quite yet in quantum field theory, but just in uh, symplectic geometry. So let me quickly sketch what the argument is in quantum field theory, but let me also refer you to Francesco's lectures for more details. So imagine we would like to compute this path integral on the four sphere, where 
of course I have just e to the minus s where s is the action and O is some insertion. Say I want to compute some correlators, I can insert whatever fields I need to actually compute that correlator. So say I would like to compute these objects. Then, very much like Francesco did this morning, you can in fact show that this object is equal to the following object where I have deformed the action with some Q exact term. So here V is V is some fermionic functional. It's some arbitrary fermionic functional at the moment. And Q is uh, such that three equal uh, three requirements are true. So this equality is only true if, first of all, Q is a symmetry of S. Second, the operator insertions I have over here are also annihilated by the Q I choose. And thirdly, So this you can think of as equivalently closed, but we need to make sure that it is in fact, well, we need to make sure that Q squared, which is not necessarily zero, just as it was not zero in Francisco's lectures, we need to make sure that it is also invariant under Q squared. So those are the three requirements. If those are through, if those are go through, then the argument you can make is very similar to what we heard this morning. You can take the derivative with respect to t of this object. You will pull down this integral, goes here. Now, because q is a symmetry of both s and the operator, you can put q outside of everything. Well, it's both symmetry of s and o, and q squared on v is equal to zero. So really, well, maybe I should write the argument. So I'm going to take the derivative of this object. So this will be equal to uh, the same thing, but with this extra insertion. Sorry, I should have an O here. So I have Q integral V, maybe with a minus sign, additionally inserted. S minus T Q V. Sorry, you, you know what sits here. Uh, so now, because O was killed by Q, S is killed by Q, and Q squared on the integral of this fermionic thing is also zero, I can rewrite this as an overall Q variation of something. And total Q variations in the path integral are zero. They're like total derivatives. So this thing is really zero. So this is the localization argument in quantum field theory, sketched out somewhat quickly. And once we have this statement, there's a few choices we need to make in order to get to some useful expression for the path integral we would like to compute. So uh, at the moment, this was just any fermionic functional. And the argument, if these three statements are true, guarantees that this is equal to the thing I actually would like to compute. But if I now choose v, if I choose v such that its bosonic part is positive semi-definite. So this is really the equivalent statement of what Francesco had this morning in terms of the norm squared of the, uh, of the vector that generated the isometry. So if this fermionic functional, sorry, if Q on this fermionic functional is such that the bosonic part is positive semi-definite, then I can take this expression, send T to infinity, I will create infinitely steep potential wells for the bosonic fields, and they will all localize to the localization locus, which is described by precisely the equation here, but when it is saturated. So this statement 
for such a V, this equality can be further refined if this V is true to a sum or an integral, whatever it takes, of configurations which are zeros of QV, where the operator insertion is evaluated on this configuration, where we evaluate the classical action on this configuration. And of course, we're still doing quantum mechanics. So even though I have this infinitely steep potential well, I still need to take into account little fluctuations around the bottoms of those wells. And that translates into the insertion of, additionally, a one-loop determinant. So this one-loop determinant is really the quantum field theory analog of the product of eigenvalues that Francesco had this morning. So when doing localization in quantum field theory, there's really three things you need to figure out. You need to figure out what is the localization locus, what are the zeros of the supersymmetric variations of this fermionic functional that I chose. You need to evaluate classical action on those configurations. And finally, you need to compute the one loop determinant of quadratic fluctuations, where the quadratic fluctuations should be computed for the deformation action, since that is obviously the dominant piece. The deformation action is the thing that creates infinitely steep potential wells, and which is where the quadratic fluctuations happen. So three things to do to perform a localization computation, and really two choices to make. The first choice you should make is... This After the sum and interval, that's a Q or an O. This thing? No, 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 above it. That's being restricted to... Ah, yeah, it's the O. Yeah, it's the old the operator insertion or whatever insertion I'm considering. So two choices to make. The argument I gave you is true for any choice of supersymmetry variation. So you need to make a choice of a supersymmetry. And you should make a choice of V. V is really not all that constrained. It just needs to satisfy condition 3 over there. And you should choose it such that the bosonic part of its supersymmetry variation is positive definite. So for localization on S4, I will make my choices. I would choose a supercharge, which in fact lies in a massive algebra, such that I can study massive theories. And I will in fact choose a supercharge, which is preserved also in, on this quashed force sphere. It's clear that not all supersymmetries in the OSP2 slash 4 are still preserved on this quashed manifold, just because you don't have a full SP4 of isometries present. What you do have, you can see it from there, are two U1s. The U1 that rotates X1 and X2, and the U1 that rotates X3 and X4. So I should, in principle, allow for, or I could consider supersymmetries as squared to these two U1 symmetries. And in fact, I will choose Q such that it squares to B, where B was this squashing parameter, square root L over L tilde, J12 plus B inverse J34. So one two J12, J34 are the rotations of coordinates X1, X2, X3, X4 in that notation, plus B plus B inverse R, where R is the SU2R symmetry, uh, the Cartan of the SU2R symmetry. So these factors B and, and B inverse, um, if you compute, well, if I would have given you the, 
precise expression for the conformal killing spinners, or in this case, just the killing spinners, satisfying some generalized killing spinner equation, then you could just compute this square explicitly and you would find all these coefficients. So which supervisor was preserved on the splash test for, for massless and massive theory? Uh, do you remember? Uh, um, it's some suburbs. Mm, maybe SU1 slash 1 times SU1? Yeah, it's a bunch of SU1 slash 1. So. Okay. I would think it's two, just because there's two, two assumptions, but maybe it's only just one. That may also be. I, I, I'm not sure. It's, as Bruno says, it's a bunch of SU1 slash 1s, maybe just one, maybe two. Okay, so for this particular Q, I'm not going to describe what xi and xi tilde should be. But I just want to emphasize one property, namely that xi vanishes at the North Pole and xi tilde vanishes at the South Pole, equal to zero at South Pole. You'll see in a second why that is an important observation. So, okay, I chose some Q. I could have chosen, well, on, I, on S4B, it's not very easy to find other Qs. Maybe there's an, just one other. Maybe that's not the case. I don't remember. On round S4, of course, I had a lot more choice. And in fact, if you make these other choices, you find dramatically different localization results. Um, if you're interested, I can tell you more. Maybe Balt will talk about it next week. Maybe not, uh, I don't know. So the other localization result that you could find is you could, for example, localize onto what goes under the name of the Chiral algebra associated to 4D n equals 2 theories. Or at least you can do so for free hypermultiplets. So anyway, so I chose some Q. It's not the only choice on round S4. It's pretty much a unique choice on the squashed four sphere. And now I need to choose uh, V. I need to choose this fermionic functional with property number three over there, such that the bosonic part is positive definite. So the canonical choice for such a V is easily described. You just focus on this condition over here. QV should be positive definite in its bosonic subsector. Well, if I then just take the sum over all fermions, all fermions in the theory, I take their supersymmetry variation complex conjugate times the fermion again, where, of course, implicitly I'm contracting all the relevant indices. If I write this down, then, of course, if I act with Q, the bosonic part will be Q psi dagger Q psi, which, of course, is positive de definite. Then it also satisfies property number three. Um, well, maybe you should do that as an exercise. I don't know. It's pretty obvious by just realizing that whatever you will have written here looks like a singlet under everything if the killing spinner is treated as a field. Of course, the killing spinner is not a field, so the killing spinner is not part of, of this Q squared transformation. Q squared doesn't act on the killing spinner, but in fact, you may as well consider it as acting on the killing spinner because Q squared acting on the killing spinner is equal to zero. If you act with these bosonic symmetries, what they would do on the indices described or ascribed to the killing spinner, you will find zero. Said differently, the well, never mind. So this is the quick argument. Maybe you can uh, flesh it out in some exercise. So this is a good choice. It's the canonical choice. And given this Q and this V, we can start localizing. So let's start with step number one. We should find what are the zeros of the bosonic subpart of QV. Now, given that I chose V over there as the sum over all the fermions in the theory, it's clear that the bosonic uh, 
sub, well, that these zeros are described by just demanding that q psi is equal to zero for all the fermions subject to the reality condition that defines this dagger over there. Subject to reality condition. Okay, so the transformation rules are still around. We have transformations on fermions over here. We have transformations on fermions over here. I'm probably not going to describe what are the precise reality conditions because I'll simply tell you the answer. The answer is that for the hypermultiplet, all hypermultiplet fields are set to zero. For the vector multiplet, things are a little bit more interesting, but I should first make one small comment. As the OS over here indicates, uh, these are on-shell transformation rules, which is not good for the localization argument. The reason is, uh, okay, it's erased. The reason is that Q squared on, this, on V should, well, you want to make sure that Q squared on V is equal to zero, but if Q is not closed off shell, you will find equations of motions in that thing and you want to avoid that from happening. So you should really make sure that over here you also have an off shell description. Now off shell descriptions of hypermultiplets, they don't uh, exist for all supersymmetry variations in the supersymmetry algebra. But they do exist if you make specific choices and of course we made a very specific choice. We chose this particular this particular Q over there is just one supersymmetry and one supersymmetry we can put off shell also for the hypermultiplet. So you will introduce a bunch of auxiliary fields with their own transformation rules and they will also appear in the transformation rules of the fermions such that this thing actually closes off shell. It's just a side comment. If you do all that then you reach a conclusion for this particular choice of Q, that all hypermultiplet fields are equal to zero. Now for the vector multiplet, things are a little bit more interesting. So what we're really doing is we're solving this equal to zero and this equal to zero subject to a reality property. Um, and the answer, let me just tell you, is that the field string should be zero, which which I can take to mean that in some choice of gauge, the gauge field is actually zero. And additionally, these complex scalars, phi and phi bar, uh, they are equal, and they are equal to some constant. Where, okay, I put some minus i over two for no good reason. So phi and phi bar are equal and constant and the auxiliary field, the triplet of auxiliary fields is also constant and proportional to some particular tensor Wij, where this Wij is really defined as the following object. It's a vulnerable object. So remember the definition of S that related Xi prime to Xi itself. You contract that with this bilinear, you divide by what is, is essentially the norm of Xi, and that is what this W is. So this thing is symmetric in its indices I and J because sigma is symmetric in its spinner indices and Xi, and xi I and Xi J were chosen to be Grassmann even. So you want, well, you need to have the symmetry so i and j are symmetric. So this is a symmetric tensor in i and j, and the ij is proportional to that thing with proportionality constant, this constant matrix A, which also appears here. The subscript on A is that it's, it's just zero, yeah. Well, you know what. I'm just trying to follow, anyway, some notational conventions. So this is the vector multiplet. Uh, localization locus, or at least it is the smooth part of the vector multiplet localization locus. 
So let me indicate that. These are the smooth solutions. But I remarked earlier, it's probably still written there, Xi vanishes at the North Pole and Xi tilde vanishes at the South Pole. So if you look at these transformation rules, we don't care about anything else. We know that that satisfies the smooth solution. But then additionally, if Xi vanishes at the North Pole, Sigma MN, FMN can be anything it wants at the North Pole. And similarly here, if Xi tilde vanishes at the North Pole, Sigma tilde MN, FMN can be anything it wants at the South Pole. So in particular, that means that at the North Pole, so using that sigma is really anti-self-dual, that means that at the North Pole, the constraint on f is a little bit weaker. It's not that you need to set the full f to 0, but you just need to set the self-dual part to 0. And similarly, at the South Pole, you don't need to set the full field strength to 0 but just the anti-self-dual part. So these equations are respectively the instanton and anti-instanton equation. And, well, they're part of the localization locus, so we will have to take them into account when, when performing step two and step three. Um, <laughs> I was just going to ask. <laughs> uh, okay, I think I can at least finish step two and step three. So step two, we're supposed to evaluate the classical action on the localization locus. I've described the localization locus there. It's clear that the hypermultiplet actions will not contribute anything because the localization locus is trivial. The vector multiplet part does contribute something, which is purely from phi's and d's. Uh, of course, the action is gone, but you remember that d entered quadratically, which is essentially the only location from which we're going to get anything. Anyway, when you do it, you just find something quadratic with some prefactor So here I introduced a hat. a hat is just the same as a, a well a zero really, um, with a factor of l and l tilde absorbed. So I'm a bit ambiguous whether I'm doing S4 or the squashed four sphere. The supercharge I chose was valid for the squashed four sphere, so I may as well think of doing the squashed four sphere. But of course, on the squashed four sphere, I haven't told you how to write down an invariant action, given that you have all these supergravity background fields present. So anyway, I'll, I'll be a bit ambiguous, but if you like, you just think about round S4. So OK, this is it. Just uh, evaluated the classical action on that smooth configuration. Of course, the instantons will also contribute their own classical action pieces, but I will get to that in a second. And the third step is to compute the one loop determinant of quadratic fluctuations uh, of the deformation action. Now, there's a lot of technology that goes into actually performing such a computation. So this step, it, it's easy enough. You just take the configuration, you plug it in, you find the result. Computing one loop determinants, it's, um, well, you can do it in the low brown way. You just stare at the deformation action. You write down the operator that describes the quadratic fluctuations. So this is the co field configuration. You consider small variations around that field configuration. You uh, find the operator which describes quadratic fluctuations. And then you just compute the eigenvalues of those operators. And the bosonic, for the bosonic fields, you get a determinant of the quadratic, the operator describing quadratic uh, fluctuations in the, in the denominator. So roughly you get 
determinant of some operator describing quadratic fluctuations for the bosons. Similarly, you get some determinant, maybe some Fafian, whatever, fermions. And you're supposed to compute these kinds of ratios of eigenvalues of these operators describing quadratic fluctuations. Um, okay, this is a hard problem, especially when you're not on S4 but on the squashed four sphere. On S4, you can try to diagonalize the operators you find by introducing some spherical harmonics. No one has actually done it because there is a better way. And in any case, writing down spherical harmonics would not work as soon as you're on the squashed four sphere. So the better way is by using indexed theorems which I will not explain at all, but I think next week you will have four lectures on precisely this topic. So you will learn all about it. Uh, long story short, I will just write the answer for the one loop determinant of quadratic fluctuations around these smooth configurations. It takes the form of a product of over all the positive roots of the Lie algebra associated to the Lie group where the Lie group is really my gauge group of upsilon of an upsilon function and the second upsilon function. I'll define in a second what the upsilon function looks like. It's some regularization of an infinite product, but let me first write down the one loop determinant for the hypermultiplet. It's a product over all the weights in the representation in which the hypermultiples transform, under which the tra hypermultiples transform of again some upsilon function So this B is again the squashing parameter. If you like the round sphere better, so just set B equals to 1. And Q is B plus B inverse. I already explained what A hat was. Uh, these are the weights. I think I explained all symbols except for upsilon B. So upsilon B of X, as I said, it's particular regularization of an infinite product. And the infinite product looks like so. A product over m and n, positive integers of mb plus nb inverse plus x times m plus 1b plus n plus 1b inverse minus x. So if you had done the computation in terms of these differential operators described in the quadratic fluctuations, you would have found a ratio of eigenvalues. If you simplify that ratio, then for example for the vector multiplet, you would see that only modes of the fermions still uh, survive at the end of the day. And for hypermultiplets, since there is an inverse here, you find that mo only modes of bosonic fields contribute at the end of the day. Now the fact that you should expect a lot of cancellations is of course a consequence of supersymmetry. And this is exploited in the index theorem approach, which I will not talk about. So, okay, I will stop here, but you can see how to put these ingredients together to get the answer up to, um, an important up to, up to the instanton contributions. Okay. Is it possible that, that your, uh, you gave different weight on the x 1 to 5 to have different squashing? Uh, because in the previous case, for this squashing, you uh, only keep like u1 plus u1 as right? But what if you have a squashing like uh, make the, for example, x 1 to 3 equal weighted and you will have a bigger. Sure, you have a bigger isometry group. Then would this. Uh, uh, are the assumptions looks uh, different from this? No. You can still choose the same supercharge. The supercharge I chose will be present. It's present for the squashed four sphere and anything that has more isometries. So in your case, if, if you set R and L equals to... I mean, there are two different questions, right? Right. One is a sensible solution, another one is a sensible solution.
Right, but I think I think the only squashings I've seen can always be reduced to this squashing, but maybe you're more inventive. But you're right. In, in because of different squashing, and also even if it's the same geometry, sometimes there are different multiple ways of the Right. There could be different squashings, but the question is really whether the answer is different. Then. But I don't think it will be different. <laughs>